In the work that I do outside the university, in medical education, and inside the university, one of the areas that I've gotten really interested in over the, the last few years is, is innovation and the role it plays in, in the work that we do. What is innovation? How could it be, you know, how could it be harnessed? How do we look at innovation as an organization, as an academic organization, or as an entrepreneurial organization? Um, uh, but I won't be alone in doing that, so that's why there are a few other chairs, and this is going to be a slightly different grand rounds. So we're going to have some fantastic folks that many of you already know uh, uh, here, uh, including Dr. Ian Kim, Dr. Jerry Rowley, Dr. Brad Sutton. And as you can see from their various roles, some of them have roles that include innovation in their titles. And so we'll, have, we'll hear from them later on about how does innovation work for them or work, how do they work with innovation in, every, in their everyday work uh, at the uh, university. These are some of our disclosures. Uh, I will talk a little bit about some of my innovation work with ScholarRx and First Aid, and those are two uh, commercial entities that in, in medical education. All right. So, but before we get going, I, you know, I, I, you know, I want you to get involved. Um, you know, uh, I want you to think about what is innovation, and uh, I would like for you to turn to somebody next to you, preferably somebody you don't know, but I think everybody knows each other. Uh, and I know it's a little sparse, but I would like you to each spend a minute or 30 seconds talking to each other about what you think innovation is. What does innovation mean to you? All right, looks like some good chatter. Why don't we, uh, why don't we uh, uh, you know, wrap, wrap things up? So um, I suspect in your pairwise conversations you had a number of, well, you know, well, you know it, it can be like this. I've seen this as an example and so forth. So... Um, you know, this is my third time giving a variation this talk, mostly in medical education innovation, but in my discussions with colleagues and folks at other schools and so forth, you know, we, we often find that it's a struggle to actually define what innovation is. But, like pornography, we know it when we see it, right? So the Justice of Potter Stewart from the famous 1964 case about what is, you know, hardcore pornography. Um, so, you know, so here's an example of you see it you know it when you see it, right? So we all probably grew up with these glass bottles. You know, us, you know, the, the younger folks, maybe the residents in terms of they probably already installed this. So the first thing you notice about, you know, the, the newer ketchup bottles is they're upside down. Why, right? Because it turns out, as we all know, it's hard to get ketchup out of a glass bottle, right? You're, you're trying to, you know, knock it out and so forth, right? But about 15 years ago, somebody had the bright idea that, wait, wait, what, what if you can actually create a plastic bottle, squeeze bottle, flip it over some, uh, upside down, the ketchup is always going to be on the bottom, right? So that's an example of innovation. So we'll talk a little bit about you know how this might meet the criteria for innovation. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something that once introduced becomes almost obvious. So innovation has a tendency to say to be in in you know in retrospect, oh that's obvious. Why didn't we think about that in the first place? And sometimes conceptually it's quite simple, but there is actually some technology behind that because to be able to actually create a plastic bottle where you put ketchup in it and then be able to squeeze it out. They actually had to create silicon coated valves that could actually hold the ketchup in it, but then with the right amount of pressure can release the ketchup once you squeeze it so that you know ketchup just doesn't like drip out you know the bottom of the squeeze bottle and so forth. And so that actually required patents and you know some you know mechanical engineering time and somebody made some quite a few uh, royalties off that patent for uh, the Heinz company. So an example of an innovation. All right. Um, now if you ask me, well, you know what what give me a word definition, like a Merriam-Webster dictionary type of definition, there's plenty. You Google it around, just Google what is innovation, you will get you know, dozens and dozens of innovation. Our panelists can probably attest to that. <clears throat> this is probably my favorite one. Um, this is Kurt Curtis Carlson. He's the ex-president of SRI International. You would know SRI International because they're in the business of inventing. And one of the things they happened to invent about 10 years ago and they sold to Apple is a little thing called Siri. You probably talk to Siri quite a lot. You know, if not, you're talking to Cortana or Google or Alexa, right? So Siri is the grandmother of all these, and, and she continues obviously to evolve. And so, you know, they have a whole business process centered around innovation. He gave a talk uh, last year, a couple of years ago, at the Stevens Institute of Technology, where he said, like to him, innovation, to paraphrase, is a process where whereby we deliver new sustainable value to society. So I, I, I kind of go for a broad definition that's most attractive to me, but to me it also has to have sustain. so broad but durable, right? So some people will say, well, uh, innovation is something novel, but to me it's not novel unless it actually impacts society. 
if it's novel, it's an invention. Uh, it can be creative, but it doesn't actually move the needle for society. Then to me, in my, in my you know, uh, definition, it doesn't really count as a true innovation. All right, so how are other ways you can look at innovation? This is a, this is a, a pretty familiar diagram for folks who work in business processes that innovation often has to, to be a true innovation that's sustainable, that has general impact, it has to, you know, uh, work at the intersection of, of certain things, like, uh, you know, what, it, it answers certain deep questions, like, what is feasible? What is technologically feasible or scientifically feasible, right, for us in healthcare and, and, and basic science? What is viable, right, uh, from a business, from a governance standpoint, and then from a human standpoint, from a humanistic standpoint, what is desirable and what is usable, right? So a, an innovation typically has to, uh, 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 you know, has to satisfy all three of those questions at a very deep level to be something that's true, unique, sustainable, and actually changes the society. Um, so let's, uh, and so another thing that uh, uh, innovations tend to do is they tend to minimize trade-offs. Often, like, you know, you go to your department chair and say, well, I want to do this. And she says, well, I'll give you more money, but then I'll have to take money away from this department or this service or whatever. There are traders, often trade-offs. But innovation, if a true innovation can somehow work around some of the perceived trade-offs, all right? Um, now, innovation often, as I mentioned, uh, you know, you, can, you generally see, uh, know it when you see it. And we tend to, and I just had this discussion with uh, Brad down here, that we tend to think of innovation as synonymous with technology. And often it is, right? So Facebook, uh, Google Search, um, uh, you know, the, the Amazon store, uh, um, the iPhone, and so forth, right? But innovation can occur in any domain, any domain. So I work with Center College. I, I serve on their board of trustees. I say, hey, look, you can have innovation in art. You know, impressionism, French Impressionism was an innovation in the late 1800s, okay? Uh, it, can, it can be in other places like sports, okay? So I'll, 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 I'll demure for a bit. As you know, most of my bracket was busted. I don't know what your bracket looks like, but mine's in total shambles. So, you know, let's talk about innovation in basketball for just uh, a minute, right? So in, up till the 1930s, uh, the way to get a shot in from the perimeter was essentially a set shot. So who plays basketball? Tell me what a set shot is. Does anybody play basketball? Basketball, then you teach kids basketball. All right, so a set shot is where you, you shoot the ball, but a foot is always on the ground. You notice that? By the way, this is um, uh, 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 Dave, uh, oh my gosh, the, the, the guy that played baseball. <laughs> Jackie Robinson, yes, I apologize. Kick, copy us and I kicked on. This, is, this was, he was a letterman at UCLA, and this was him in like 1938. The sport revolutionized when this fella, by the name of Kenny Saylor, uh, who played for the University of Wyoming, essentially developed the jump shot. So as you can see, he's about a foot and a half off the ground. You can see his defender is trying to block him, but his feet's still on the ground. This was revolutionary in 1942, right? He actually then took, you know, and because of that jump shot, he took Wyoming to their first, I believe, only national championship in 1943-44. Went on to play uh, uh, in the early NBA, right? And so... That broke. That was the. That was the. That was the, uh, the. The the innovation that revolutionized the sport. And then after that, things continue to evolve. Right now, you have the fadeaway jump shot. You see Kobe Bryant jumping away. Right, so it's harder to defend. All right, and then you've got uh, Hart, you know James Harden doing the step back jump shot. So if you notice when he goes, he fakes forward and then jumps back, then jumps and then creates separation. So. All of these are variations of what Kenny Saylor did in 1942. So again, it doesn't have to be technology, right? It can be a technique. All right, so, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Jerry Robley and I talk about this. He, he, uh, uh, he, he ran in uh, kind of an innovation uh, um, education group that I was part of early on in the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, where, and and one, of the, one of the things we read was one of the papers from uh, Clayton Christensen. So Clayton Christensen, as many of you know, is a... Uh, highly, highly regarded uh, uh, management, organizational management uh, professor at the Harvard Business School, and in the late 80, 90s, uh, you know, wrote this book called *The Innovator's Dilemma*. Started off actually as a monograph in, in the Harvard Business Review, but he coined this idea of what's called disruptive innovation. So, how is disruptive innovation different than just say regular innovation? So, disruptive innovation, as you can probably guess from the adjective has the ability to disrupt whole industries, right? Because you're thinking, well, who gets disrupted, right? Is that necessarily a good thing, right? So 
uh, in the model uh, 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 in that he's refined over the years, what you have is you have an incumbent. The incumbent could be a, 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 a commercial retailer like Barnes and Noble, or it could be uh, Kodak and so forth. Let's use Kodak because that's one of the, the that's one of the seminal examples, or one of the uh, the key examples here. Kodak, you know, had a hundred year business in film, right? They're in the film technology, right? And then in the late '90s, uh, you know, somebody came along and figured out how to, you know, invent the digital camera, right? So filmless pictures, right? And so what you see here on this graph here is that you know society, you know, wants high performance products, right, over time, uh, but they're only willing to pay so much for it, right? And so you can see that, you know, but as time goes on in a mature market, expectations rise, uh, and what they're willing to pay for it also uh, essentially will rise as well too. And that's where, you know, organizations can get their margins to support their mission, whether they're a for-profit or a non-profit, and then there's a mainstream. But at some point, what happens is somebody comes in with a radically new technology that actually may not have some as good as a performance, for example, you know, digital cameras when they first came out in the 1990s had extremely low resolution, right? Uh, so they could never compete with 35 millimeter film, but they were radically different in another way. You know, they had they had a radically different you know use structure that you know uh, that were that, that uh, addressed at least the low end of the market. And over time, as they move here, as they capture the mainstream, they undercut the incumbents. You know, market. So they don't actually have to take all the revenue. All they have to do is take away your profit margin. Then you die. That's it, right? So that's what happened to Kodak. Kodak died. All right. And now their brand is subsumed into other things like selfie sticks. So that's not where you want to end up. Um, so now, of course, as you can imagine, people said, well, what is, what is some other behemoth industry out there that's really slow to change and could itself be disrupted? Ding, 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 ding. Us, right? So... Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, Clayton Christensen uh, saw that, saw some of those parallels, and co-wrote a, a, a book called *The Innovative Prescriptions*, where he again, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, applied the uh, principles of uh, disruptive innovation to that uh, sector, and with some advice about how we could do it. Um, Eric Topol, who is the director of the Scripps Institute, uh, uh, used to be at, Cle at the Cleveland Clinic, ran their cardiovascular medicine. Uh, is one of the more influential, uh, obviously, uh, physicians in the organization in this country, uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Creative Destruction of Medicine, right? And then uh, Jeff Elton, who is the practice lead for Accenture, uh, you know, for, for healthcare strategy, you know, recently wrote a book called Healthcare Disrupted. So you can see here, disruption, destruction, disrupted. you getting a little sense of the theme here, sounding a little apocalyptic here, right? You know, does... Does it all have to be like that? And we'll talk a little bit about different types of innovations. Does it have to be disruptive or not? All right, so let's talk a little bit about innovations in medicine. So, you know, and, you know, uh, if I asked you, and we don't have time for this, but if I asked you to come up with, the, you know, uh, examples of innovation, of course you'd be able to come up with many, many things that impact your life, impact the lives of your patients, uh, you know, right off the bat. Things like minimally invasive, minimally invasive surgery that uh, revolutionize the field. Uh, more recently, you know, the introduction of CRISPR-Cas9 as a genome editing tool that's revolutionizing ge genetic medicine uh, uh, for drug development, potentially for therapeutics in the future, right? Uh, so, you know, you can come and you can come up with a, a couple dozen, probably as a group right now, you wanted to. I'm going to spend a minute or two talking about education innovation because that's my particular love and field. So, um, Case Western has uh, partnered up with uh, um, uh, with Microsoft and with their. Uh, HoloLens augmented reality technology. So you can see this medical student wearing this device. It's projecting uh, a direct, it's called a direct light field technology, direct, uh, directly uh, projecting light on his eyes. And so he actually perceives what, what is a human anatomical model, you know, out in 3D space in the context of a room. So it's different than virtual reality like uh, Oculus Rift where you put something on and there's no power. All you're seeing is blackness. You are here, you actually see the room around you and then it's projecting this. Magic Leap, there's other folks that are getting in this space, but they're using, and they're using it mostly for entertainment, sports and stuff like that, but uh, it could be used obviously for uh, um, education. And in this particular case, they can actually take a vertebra and then you can mag it up to 30 feet so the student can actually walk to, through the vertebra, you know, see all the facets, the connections and so forth. Um, again, uh, you know, innovation doesn't have to involve technology. Uh, some of the students might recognize this. I'm going to call him Joe here because I know him. What are these students doing? What kind of education methodology is this? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. They've got cards up. Amy Holthauser does this to you guys. 
TBL, team-based learning, right? So this is what's called a TRAT, right? This is team readiness assurance testing. So it allows teams of students to teach each other uh, and, and so forth. So it's a lot different from when I was lectured uh, to at UCF, literally lectured to at UCSF, you know, where, you know, it was a stage on the stage like what I'm doing right now. Uh, whereas here, the students are actually doing self-directed learning, self-regulated learning, taking uh, responsibilities for some of their own teaching uh, 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 and goal setting as well, too. All right, so raise your hand if you've seen this book or used this book, right? So most of the medical students have used it. This was a revolution 28 years ago. Um, and you know, at the time, nobody really thought that students could write textbooks for each other uh, that could be used at a high, high level. Uh, and so we were able to pioneer a methodology that would allow them to do that, obviously with the support of teaching faculty. Um, and we're actually now trying to extend that by you know, having you know, students and teaching faculty from across the country develop what we call the Lego bricks of medical education. So you know, self-contained learning experience that can be snapped together quite easily by um, uh, teaching faculty to create unique curricular experiences regardless of where they're at. What about, uh, what about within the School of Medicine itself? Um, uh, you know, several years ago, Dean Ganzel and other deans, including uh, uh, Dr. Robley, noticed issues with uh, student stress, uh, burnout, potential depression, and potentially a risk of su suicidality, right? And this was really a very much a, a nascent field, and there wasn't really much leadership going on. They worked with other centers like Adi Haramadi at, uh, at Centel at Georgetown, and they developed a student wellness program. So this is an integrated program that's part of the curriculum, not just outside the curriculum, that uh, includes in, uh, uh, integrated activities, lunch and learns, brief programs, electives, that allow students to explore issues with wellness, resilience, uh, depression, substance abuse, uh, transition to professional environments from you know, undergraduate uh, to clinical uh, professional identity formation and so forth, all right? And uh, thanks to uh, Olivia Mettle, who is the Associate Dean for uh, Student Affairs for providing me this information. All right, so let me get back to this whole thing about you know, uh, innovation uh, in healthcare, right? And, and potentially disruption, but we'll set that aside. So you know, do we need to be disrupted? Uh, if, you, if you look at a recent New England Journal of Medicine survey, the answer is yes. So they surveyed 500 plus uh, national thought leaders in healthcare uh, a year ago uh, through the uh, New England Journal of Catalyst uh, program. And what you see is the top three, the top three areas that they thought needed disrupting the most were hospital and health systems, healthcare IT, so including uh, EMRs, primary care, and then it goes on, you know, uh, Pharmaceutical, commercial payers, so basically all the players in healthcare, right? But guess what? Number one and number three, that's us, right? You know, we are part of that system, whether it's healthcare or primary care, that potentially needs disrupting. So, where is this disrupting going to come from? Where is this innovation going to come from? Well, let me give you a hint. It may not be us necessarily, right? So, again, they asked, where did they think the sources of innovation might come from? So, we are the light blue group. So, we are the traditional healthcare organizations, companies. Uh, the teal is the focus startup. So within, so what they're basically saying, they're thinking that a lot of the innovation, disruptive innovation potentially is gonna come from without and not so much from within, all right? So we'll just kind of put that thought on hold for now and then we'll have a discussion later about whether that's appropriate for us or not to be involved in disruptive innovation and to what extent. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Accelerating innovation. If we do believe, and you know, I, you know, and I, I grant you, I, I'm not sure I've made the argument quite yet that we all need to innovate, and innovation is necessary, a good thing. But we think that innovation is synonymous with success, good outcomes, you know, better metrics, so forth. You know, how can we potentially think about incorporating innovation in an academic medicine setting? So, who is this fellow? He is one of our preeminent inventors of the early, late. Uh, uh, you know, early 20th century, late 19th century. And by the way, Thomas Edison, right, in his lab, all right? So, so I'm going to use Thomas Edison, uh, not just as inspiration, but also to kind of address some potential myths about, you know, innovation, where it comes from, how it gets done, and so forth. So one of the things that we think about innovation is that you have to be a genius. You have to be like an Einstein or Thomas Edison to, uh, to really to, to innovate. Uh, and it just comes to you. You're either born an innovator or you're not. Turns out there's a lot of literature that says that innovation can be taught. And there are 
plenty of well-established innovation methodologies out there, some of which we're quite familiar with, right? Including basic research, you know, the scientific method, right, is a method of innovation, of, you know, inquiry, of knowledge, of, you know, hypothesis testing and so forth, right? So, uh, so Satel, who wrote a whole book about this, said, look, what are the different types of innovations out there and when does it work? And so he kind of looked at it as, you know, well, you know, there, there may be different techniques that are better, you know, for when the problem is well-defined versus not well-defined. So basic research, for example, which one is, is probably better for when the problem's not well defined. And also when the skill domains that might be needed to solve the problem is also well, not well defined. So basic research tends to be a little bit better in those areas. But when the problem is well defined and maybe the skill sets are well defined, you can look at other things like road mapping, more incremental things, or even things like in design thinking, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Disruptive innovation, right? Um, what we talked about tends to be more of a venture based model. Uh, lean launch pack, we'll talk a little, you know, we could, you know, uh, which is uh, kind of a, um, kind of like a, um, using a lean startup, lean, lean manufacturing methodology from Toyota, you know, can, can be, can be useful here as well too. Uh, when, uh, when you need to disrupt something or when you need to innovate where the problem's not well defined, but the techniques are, you know, so it can, it can address certain, uh, uh, certain areas. All right. Um, uh, this is, uh, um, from, Another book from Nathan Fur, and they wrote they wrote this for the Harvard Business Review as well too. Is that when you look at all these methods, whether uh, again it's you know design thinking, lean launchpad, lean startup, open innovation, and even a little bit of you know the scientific method, there are a couple of sometimes there are a couple of you know steps that are semi analogous. You know, so for example, you know it often starts with some sort of insight, some sort of observation, natural in nature, in the environment, and so forth, that leads one to start hypothesizing of what's going on, what might be the problem, what might be the issue, uh, and then setting up experiments to, or to, uh, to find out is this something that actually can impact it. So, you know, obviously this is more solution oriented, so can we prototype something? And then if it actually works, then, you know, how do we actually scale it up? How do we address some of the business viability issues? And then scale it and get it to market, get it to society, you know, the broader, the broader world, right? Um, and uh, uh, Fur and Dyer, you know, kind of took some of the same thing that Satel did, but then they layered it out along this process. So when you're looking at these various steps and so forth, where you're at the insight level or the problem solution, there's certain, some of these techniques fit better in certain areas than others, all right? Um, we're going to talk about a minute about design thinking a little bit, because that's something that's caught on quite a bit. I'm not, I'm not going to... to uh, uh, necessary say that's the best technique or so, but I'm just saying it's something that's coming up quite a bit at, at a lot of the uh, education or a lot of the academic innovation conferences around the, the country. So what is design thinking just as, as one, uh, one method, right? So design thinking has several steps and then if you kind of look at the various steps, um, it kind of fits that model, uh, you know, that we talked a little bit earlier. You can see how it might cross over with things that you're familiar with, such as the scientific method. Empathize. So, the, uh, you know, the scientific uh, design thinking has a big emphasis on understanding the problems of your users. Who is your audience? Who you're trying to serve? Is it your patients, your faculty, your medical students, your residents, your staff? You know, so what are their problems? What are their biggest pain points? And actually, not necessarily, you know, uh, and if they have solutions, like you know, uh, you know, Joe says, hey, look, you know, I'll do better on the boards if you give me half the day off or whatever, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I know Joel will just go home and study, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to get down to the problem and the, pro and the job that needs to be done. So that's part of the definition of what that, what the actually underlying issue is, uh, and not trying to jump to the solution space before you've actually well identified the problem space. And then you can ideate based on the parameters of those problems, you know, and then there's a funnel system for how you do that. Uh, and then you get down to a couple of viable models for prototyping. You prototype them, you, so you put in minimum resources, but you get enough of a straw man solution to then be able to test it. And then when you test it, you take it back to the audience, you take it back to the end users, you take it back to you know, a market segment, you gather data, you refine it, so much, much like the uh, scientific method, you evaluate the data, you make decisions, you make changes, you refine or you abandon the model, pivot in a different direction, but if, you can, but if it works, then you can implement and scale up. So that's a quick uh, summary through the design thinking model. And large, uh, and a number of large organizations have adopted this. Kaiser Permanente, you know, uh, 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 commercial companies, and there's a lot of literature on this. All you have to do is Google the Harvard Business Review and design thinking, 
you'll find, find plenty of articles and case studies both in healthcare and in business that have applied this process. And we'll talk a little bit more about how some of our uh, uh, panelists may use design thinking and other methods as well too. Now let's go back to our, our, our inventor. Now, you know, um, again, true, he was true, truly a fantastic inventor, but again, but there are some things that are misleading about this picture uh, that would lead you to think that he did it a certain way. What's missing from this picture? There's nobody else, just him. A team. You need a team. You need a team. So just as we in medicine know that it's not the doctor or the physician that provides all the care, it's a team that provides the care, both in a healthcare system and, quote, unquote, outside the healthcare system, you know, with physicians, nurses, uh, administrators, uh, 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 you know, uh, social work and so forth. Um, you know, team, you know, team-based innovation models where it's at as well, too. And that, again, that gets back to my, my early things that you don't have to be the guy or gal with all the answers. You just need to have, be able to help come up with some of the questions, the right questions, and then work with the right people. Then you might be able to get to some of the right solutions. So, you know, so for us as healthcare providers, as the physicians, or as the basic scientists, if we, if we have the right group of folks, including you know, design folks and engineering and business and, and other disciplines, then we can actually get at you know, some of the things, right? So you can clearly see how you know, the, the, the MBA can slot in the, the business viability issue. The engineer or the basic science can talk about you know, scientific feasibility or, or technology feasibility. The designer you know, can connect with the human with regards to usability, desirability, and the physician provides the context that connects all the players together, right, and help, uh, help frame the, uh, the, the, the problem space. All right, and so this leads to another, uh, another uh, uh, um, factor that is typically cited as very critical for successful innovation. You need diversity. It is no, uh, uh, um, no accident that the, uh, that the areas of the country that receive the highest amount of uh, VC funding per capita, like Silicon Valley, and even, and, you know, and you can say, well, it's, it's because, you know, they're on the coast and you got New York and so forth, but you got Ann Arbor in the middle of the country, right? You know, they're actually number two behind Silicon Valley, but they're also just as diverse if you look at their population of staff, students, and so forth, you know, as Silicon Valley, all right? You need diversity. So it's not just racial and ethnic diversity, but you need, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, education diversity, you need uh, cultural diversity, you need, uh, uh, you know, different learning domain diversity to all come together. And so, in fact, you know, this was actually expounded by Jeff DeGraff, who actually is a, uh, a business professor at the Roth School of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, up at Michigan and uh, a self-proclaimed dean of innovation, but he's, he's kind of an organizational psychologist, uh, um, an organizational expert who's consulted with a lot of Fortune 500 companies when it comes to innovation. Recently wrote, wrote a book about innovation code, and he, and he gave a talk at the AMA Change Med Ed conference just last fall, and he said, look, I've seen innovation done every ways, and I know all those techniques that you guys were just talking about, but the one thing that he's seen that, that is the main common thread through all successful innovation was diversity. All right, so one last thing uh, about uh, us as an organization before we get to the panel discussion. Um, so I'm going to talk about culture. Um, and, you know, you know when, when you're in the, the boardroom or when you're in the chair's office or the division chair's office, a lot of times it's about strategy and this, that, and the other, right? And sometimes organizational culture gets overlooked as, you know, not as sexy or, or what is it, it's this big amorphous thing, and yeah, no, it's, you know, there's a lot to it, and we won't get into all that right here, but you can see some of the, some of the core things that are tied to, you know, culture, a culture of an organization, a department, uh, a, a school, uh, a healthcare system, and so forth, but, you know, <clears throat> but when you look at uh, the relative value of culture and strategy, this is a quote from Peter Drucker, who's a premium managing guru, uh, Claremont, where he basically is culture eats strategy for breakfast. So, you know, you can actually get by with a mediocre strategy if you have great culture in many cases. You know, it's not, uh, you know, nothing's guaranteed, of course, but, you know, Peter Drucker would rather take culture than breakfast. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> that over strategy, if you had to take one between the two. So I'll, this is the last slide. So, you know, this is a graphic, and there's several versions of this if you kind of Google iceberg and culture. Uh, but... This, I think, is a very apt analogy here. So as you know, you know nine-tenths of an iceberg is below water, right? So above 
the water is what you can see of an organization's culture, right? And then below is the invisible part of that organization. So, you know, two ways, that, you know, so the, the really quick way to think about it is, you know, what you can see is the, uh, about an organization culture. It answers the way we get things done, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, but invisibly, it's the way we really get things done, right? And so things above is, you know, what is the, what is our, what is our department's vision? What is our, what is our declared strategy? What are our, what are shared values that we communicate to each other? What are our policies, our processes, our goals, our three-year goals, our four-year goals, our ROI metrics, our KPIs, da 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 da. But then when you, but then when you kind of pull up, look underneath the, the the sheet and below the rug, it's really like intrinsic values, uh, shared assumptions that are not uh, verbalized, uh, feelings, stories that get passed around that that aren't culture, but it it, it manifests on how. What we do, traditions, rituals, uh, perception, how we perceive our role, how we perceive each other. These things are, as you can imagine, much harder to get at uh, to, but they actually, you know, they actually tend to be some of the bigger factors that affect culture. And if we don't, if you don't, you know, understand these well or, or and work with it well, you know, the, the quote here is that, you know, it's the iceberg that can sink any type of organization, organizational change management initiative or strategy. So, I covered quite a lot at a very, very superficial level. Uh, and I just want to kind of give you a taste uh, of, of some of these ideas and so forth, both that's, that's being discussed, you know, at, like at the level of the AMA, the AAMC, but also, you know, in, in, in the business world. But let's now actually move to a panel discussion where we will now talk about how it's actually occurring here on the ground at University of Louisville. So I want to invite our panelists up here. So if, uh, Jerry and, uh, Ian and Brad, I'll leave this up just so we'll put up the house lights. And I think we've got a couple of microphones here. And um, yeah. all right, so what we'll do? We got a hot mic. Okay, great. So I have a hot mic, and so I am good to go. Let me open up. Um, all right, so uh, we're going to just jump right into it. Uh, you know, so. Uh, first of all, again, thank, uh, thank you guys for, 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 for joining uh, and, and for uh, uh, contributing to this d discussion. Um, I want to learn a little bit more, and I'm going to start with you, Brad, and you, Ann. I want to little bit learn more about uh, CHPI, the Center for Health Process Innovation. Tell us a little bit about the center, how it came about, and, um, and why, why, why you thought process innovation was an important thing for the university to tackle. Brad, and. So uh, I want to say that we started the Center for Health Process Innovation about four or five years ago. And it came about, I think, largely from an idea that Brad and I had, as well as uh, Dean Gansel, and sort of creating a base of uh, 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 a team, uh, which we just talked about, which is necessary for consistent and successful innovation uh, throughout the university. It's not a new idea. There are multiple centers of innovation uh, around the country at other academic centers. But uh, in terms of just starting to pull together this team that uh, has rapidly grown over the past four to five years, and I can say that we have about 65 members of the team, and it spans uh, multiple schools across the university. We have uh, collaborators from the School of Business, the School of Social Work, the School of Engineering, obviously the School of Medicine also as sort of our primary component. And then it snowballed uh, so that when we started collaborating both nationally, we now have collaborators at Hopkins, Northwestern, Jefferson, Stanford, uh, because we found uh, there were like-minded faculty around the country who are looking at these same questions of how do we make things better within the context of healthcare from there. And uh, I will say up front that our field is fertile for innovation in large part because we have lagged behind uh, other industries tremendously. Uh, we have students uh, in our business distinction track, the MD MBA program, uh, who are creating projects and publishing on the academic front. And I'll give you an example of some of the quotes from our business faculty. Uh, you're really going to publish this? <laughs> Do you realize this has been done in about a dozen industries 40 to 50 years ago? 
I'm going to show this to my chair because he's going to look at that and say, I can't believe they're going to publish this. And by the way, it got published. And it shows how far behind medicine has lagged other industries in terms of innovation and change. Uh, and and it, it also shows that my response to our business colleagues around the country is better late than never to the party in terms of making changes, in terms of innovation and leanness. And, and there are other programs at other universities like Washington, University of Washington, UW, has adopted the Toyota mentality throughout. Uh, and so they are decades ahead of other programs and other centers in terms of adoption of new technology. But that's not to say that we can't catch up quickly, and we have to a large degree, because uh, we have uh, the environment, we have the talent here to do that, and uh, in four to five years, uh, we've exploded in terms of our growth. Anything, Ed, Brad? No, I think he, he said, I think the, the, the important piece is, for me, the idea really was, was born out of, uh, I think, frustration and, and the recognition that uh, we, we thought we could do what we do every day in a more cost-effective way, in a more efficient way. I think one of the, one of the really under-recognized problems in healthcare is provider burnout. Anybody who sort of had the pleasure of working with all scripts and had death by a thousand clicks realizes that, that to your point, is uh, this is a very, very fertile ground, right, for innovation. The, the thing about process engineering that I've come to understand over the last few years of doing this is that it's iterative, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you can make small splashes, but, but they're not fixes. And so I have the pleasure of being the medical director of our department. Outpatient clinics, which is a challenging job for lots and lots of reasons. And people talk to me about how, how are we going to fix the clinics. And I would submit to you they're not fixable. They're just manageable because it's predicated on people, and those people change. And what we do changes. What, what we can't change is that core mission, right? And so... I think process change, process engineering, is one form of innovation. The piece that I'm excited about, the piece that you alluded to, is what's really disruptive. Right? How do we change the way we finance healthcare? Mm -hmm. How do we apply price transparency and blockchain technology, these things that are just sort of coming to light, in a way that makes the way makes the business of medicine an entirely fundamentally different business model? How do we make the EMR relevant to the point where it's operating in the background, we don't have to interface with it, but we have third-party cloud-based software overlay that's on my iPhone. And I just talk to my patient, I FaceTime them, that drives to the EMR, it drops my bill, right? It's easy for me, yeah. and I can get about the business of being a doctor. So that's, that's what's exciting about it to me. Yeah. And so you, you touched on a, a, a theme that we've seen uh, a lot in innovation, especially in healthcare innovation, was why can't the same types of consumer-friendly technologies that we're seeing you know, in the rest of the world, like Alexa or whatnot, how, why can't that be applied to medicine today? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jerry, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your role as, you, know, you obviously wear a lot of big hats in the organization, in the school, but you know, as your role as the Associate Dean for Faculty Development, uh, you know, uh, you know, your, your thoughts and, and, and how the uh, leadership and innovation in academic medicine program came about. Well, the reason it came about was uh, there was a new LCME uh, mandate that was uh, put in place in the summer of 2015 uh, that set forth the need for a School of Medicine to have a centrally coordinated effort in faculty development. And one of the components of that related to providing um, experiences and leadership development uh, directed by the school. So I had uh, the good fortune to be able to go away for six months on sabbatical, the first half of 2015, visited eight different medical centers around the country. And one of the things that Dean Gansel asked me to do while I was away was to look at faculty development in these institutions and come back with a specific plan for how to enhance our faculty development efforts and specifically around a leadership program. And so we then, when I came back, uh, hired Stacy Sainer, who's here in the audience, as our program manager for faculty development, who, without whose help this would not have been born. Uh, she's a teacher. She's taught me how to be a teacher, though I thought I knew how to do it, but I assure you I didn't. Um, and so we spent a year working on this leadership curriculum, and the whole goal of this was to introduce to the next generation of leaders, so the upcoming division chiefs, the next generation of department chairs, to introduce very basic leadership principles to them. And we designed a 10-month course. We're finishing up our very first cohort that started in the fall of last year. 
Um, so after this year-long curriculum development process and a very rigorous uh, set of um, objectives that we wanted them to be able to do at the end of this curriculum, uh, in consultation with Sam Miller uh, from Medical Education Research and with Tao in terms of the innovation effort, we put together a, a 10-month course that meets for three hours once a month. Um, but in addition to that, there's two to three hours a week, every week during that 10-month period of time, for them to be able to engage in pre-reading. We introduced them to all this design thinking, innovation stuff on the very front end. We put those 16 people, a very diverse group of 16 people, so we have basic scientists, we have PhD faculty, we have MD faculty, uh, we have surgeons, we have pediatricians, and everything in between. And we made sure that in the four groups that we set up, of four, that there was diversity within those groups. Because we also, as you pointed out, believe that that's where the spark of conflict would happen and drive some of the innovation in the team projects that they had to come together with. And we introduced innovation early on. Tao came to the very first session. He's going to do a wrap-up later in the year to introduce them to design thinking as to what it was, how it might apply, and how they might use it in the process of their individual projects for their groups. And the reason I came up with this idea, I, I didn't come up with it, I stole it from Cleveland Clinics, one of the places that, places that I visited on sabbatical, and they had a very rigorous 10-year-long process where they've done this throughout their organization, bringing real diversity, because it's not just doctors. It's doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and every aspect of the medical enterprise in that world, bring them together, the emerging leaders put them together, and they work on projects that at the end of their year-long process are presented to the board of trustees at the Cleveland Clinic and the very best ideas or put forward to implement throughout the clinic. We wanted to do a similar sort of thing. We thought the group work of getting people to work together with people they're not used to working with would be helpful, so we did that. I assure you, and Stacy will attest to this, first three months, we saw lots of destructive, constructive conflict as they struggled with being so different and how they would come together to come up with their ideas. But they've come up with some very innovative approaches to solve some problems that we have here in the Medical Center, and they will present that to Health Sciences Center leadership in the very last session this summer. And so this is a, a work for me. Is, I really enjoy this. This is the real fun for me because in my mind, over the next 10 years, my, my last 10 years of, of being a faculty member here, I'd like to be able to say at the end of that time that we have uh, 100 or 200 people who have come through that course and are now ready to take on the mantle of leadership in a way that, that I never had an opportunity to do 30 years ago as I came through and had to go about it by a whole different set of processes to get to the point where, where I could have these leadership roles. And so I, I want to facilitate that internally. We brought in some tremendous internal and external resources into the faculty for this. This is not taught solely by me or by Stacy. This is uh, something where we brought in the best of people from College of Business, from the College of Education, to talk about organizational culture and other things. We, we organize it by two sessions on leading yourself, two sessions on leading others, two sessions on leading the organization, where we touch on many of these aspects with a, a thread of innovation that runs through all of this as it runs through their projects. So that's how it's set up. Actually, the applications for the second cohort went out yesterday, and I've got seven applicants already on day one. We had 54 applicants last year for the 16 spots. We're going to expand the class this year if we have enough applicants. And so uh, we're very excited about this program. But I wanted to bring innovation to a very uh, real group of people who are excited to be engaged in learning about general principles of leadership and how innovation might help them. Fantastic. Um, so, um, and, we're, and one of the things that I'm going to connect with that program is a little bit later is getting back to that iceberg uh, slide and to, you know, how, do we, how do we address goals, but I'm going to save that for, for, for the end. Um, I want to go to another question, getting back to something that Brad said, but you know, please jump in, any of you, uh, which is you know, you know, talk a little bit about the innovation methodology that you are using in your daily work or as part of the LEAM program or this, uh, for the Center uh, for, for, for process health, health Process Innovation. You mentioned disrupt, but, but, but we, as you can see, there's a whole variety of methodologies that, that, that can go from disrupt to sustaining incremental and so forth. You know, how have you been, what, what, what decisions have you had to make when, when, uh, you know, when adopting certain techniques or applying certain things? Anybody want to jump in? 
You know, I'll take a different viewpoint from Brad since I'm overseeing my department in the sense that we're really focusing also on incremental innovation uh, in the sense that we have started to develop other teams in that way. We have a healthcare operations team, which is seven faculty members in the Department of Pediatrics who have advanced uh, either MBAs or MHAs who are now spread out throughout the department. So we have somebody in emergency medicine, cardiology, uh, um, neonatology. And so they've started within their own divisions because they know that business model the best. And if you come from the sense of improvement and quality, and I'm going to suggest to you that your quality is another version of innovation. And that is a really fertile ground for finding like-minded people who are in the business of improvement and trying to generate value. I I really love that uh, definition that you put forth about generating durable value in that way. And I have found that that, uh, when you you get that cohort of people, which can be in the dozens within your department, then that's the critical mass that you can move forward. So we have programs that uh, are now impacting um, probably 10 or 12 divisions throughout, and they're being championed by somebody within the division. Uh, we talked a little bit before that there is high resistance to change within medicine, and I think that we are also part of that. But one of the mechanisms to lower that resistance to change is to have a champion that is trusted and is within the group so that they're, they know uh, uh, how to walk in the shoes of the people in that division in that way. And we're starting to see some great advances uh, to the point that we're even starting to publish that in that way. And that's just a a, a counterbalancing perspective uh, to sort of an incremental change, which I think is very accessible to everybody in this room in terms of uh, getting on board and then using the paradigm uh, of quality as a way to move forward in innovation because that's, that's something that's just part of our DNA. Yeah, so if you do CQI, if you know the PDSA model, that, that in and of itself is a potential innovation methodology. Any, any other comments? In my capacity at, at ULP, uh, what I have found over this past year especially is, is a real convergence of the work that's being done through this leadership course, because as we go through this, I'm learning, especially from all the people we bring in to talk to those, uh, those participants, a convergence of what I have to get done at ULP as the acting CEO and what we're trying to teach people in, in the Liam course. And I can assure you, we don't have disruptive innovation at ULP. We, we don't. In, in fact, disruptive innovation will rarely come from internal to an organization. It usually is from some external entrant into that market who sees it differently, probably not clouded by the day-to-day you know, aggravations and things that we all deal with. And so it, it would be rare unless the only big companies that have done this separate out a group and put them on the side, separately fund them, separately organize them, and say, go and disrupt our system. That's not what we're doing now. So at the ULP level, I would characterize what innovation is going on as sustaining at best. So in the block models, you saw one of the options was sustaining. But really, we're looking at trying to enhance operational effectiveness uh, across the system. Um, I am committed, I'll tell you, committed to get rid of all scripts. I'm convinced that if I'm successful at that, there'll be a parade uh, along Main Street. There's a lot of smiles. (laughs) So, so I, I, my, my personal bias is it ought to be epic across the whole system. Uh, there are potential reasons why that may not happen, but at a minimum it's going to be epic for the pediatric world as it marries up with Norton and the internal, um, I'm sorry, the um, uh, inpatient epic world and the outpatient epic world being in the new building. And at a minimum, on the adult side, Cerner, Cerner as it lines up with the ULH. My preference, and I've told Ken this, i uh, told everybody to stop and listen, it ought to be epic all around because that product is an unbelievable product. Absolutely unbelievable. If you think it makes sense, it's already in there and it works, and they're already figuring out the things that work even better than that for next time. So I'm convinced we have to get rid of it. It is a huge, huge inefficiency factor, burnout and stress factor for our physicians, and must be done away with. And so we're doing a lot of things in terms of operational effectiveness for sustaining innovation, no disruption for us. I do want to take this opportunity. I don't get to talk to the Department of Medicine very often. But I do want to say that in your iceberg model, we often hear about the stuff above the surface, the mission, vision, and values, and the way we say we get things done. But we know that the large, large impact is below that. And one of the unwritten, unstated stories, one of the assumptions that's been made around here for the past decade, maybe longer, is that You don't need a really strong Department of Medicine to have a really good medical school. That's just wrong. And I think we have have missed the mark 
greatly by that. Because just think of what doesn't happen if medicine's not strong. The, the primary care that medicine might provide, not there for referrals into the system too. Psychiatry, radiology, neurology, on, on and on. The Department of Surgery can't be as benefited if there's not a strong medicine. I just heard yesterday in the uh, dean chair meeting, remember Mark Slaughter said he, he would love to have a cardiovascular service line where he thinks transplants could be in, enhanced, lung, heart transplant and such, would really bring in money into the system but you can't get the right pulmonologists, cardiologists, and others to get hired, stay, and be incentivized to make this work. We've looked at this wrong, and the fact that we're still in these very siloed departments and not looking at cross-departmental synergies that should be there that medicine could provide. For me, the biggest challenge going forward in the next five years is to make medicine as strong as it can be. And, and from the ULP standpoint, it, we have a voice, but boy, we're not the ones fully in control of that. But I think that might be one of the innovations we have to look at is how do we resurrect and move forward in a robust Department of Medicine going forward. I know we're getting to close to the top of the hour, and I want to keep our, our audience on time here. Um, I have one more question, and hopefully we might be have a chance to open it up to the audience. So, Brad, you already alluded to it, and, and uh, Jerry, you alluded to me you know, when we, we kind of talked about the genesis of the, the, the Liam course. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the climate and the culture here for innovation. Both of you cited the support of Dean Gansel in getting both the, the center and the, the course off the ground. So tell me a little bit more about what you think the climate and the culture here is for innovation and you know, where, where are we doing okay and where could we potentially you know, uh, do better? Well, I'll give you just my perspective. I think it's getting better, but it's, it's very much a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a number of cultural challenges across our university, but one of them is structural. And so we, we are very spread thin, right, across multiple campuses. And so to our hospital partners slash sometimes competitors, um, we're easy to divide and conquer. And that's just, that's just the fact. And so when you think about it with the systems hat, how do, you, how do you develop more integrated processes, programs, efforts across these disparate campuses at the VA, ULH, Jewish Hospital, Norton Hospital, et cetera? Um, I think we've got opportunity to co-locate. We, we've got our outpatient facility next to your outpatient facility in pediatrics now. Um, we have uh, interdisciplinary sort of discussions like this, but I think it takes more than that. It takes top-down leadership. It takes appropriate resources dedicated to making it happen and doing it in a way that, that spans multiple campuses. If you think about the College of Business, the public health school, they're all in this with us. They just don't know how to connect. Right? The, the, the College of Business has a, has a business and medicine master's degree. There's a, there's a population health master's degree in public health, public health. We talk all day long about how we're going to manage population health. So we need to, we need to find a way to, to break down those silos, to appropriately resource um, uh, efforts to, to collaborate and, mm -hmm. and to move the, uh, the entire enterprise forward, not just an individual department, to your point. Yeah. Jerry, do you have any comments from, like, say, the promotion and tenure side since you're, uh, you know, you're in faculty development with them? Um, well, that's a four this month, too. Okay. <laughs> I, I wanted to comment that Dean Gansel has been a passionate supporter for the Liam program and for the other efforts in innovation, especially around mind-body medicine, wellness programs. She, she is very concerned about our students, residents, and faculty because the, the burnout issue at all those levels is a huge issue. Being uh, in, interested in mind-body medicine as well, it, it it doesn't take much innovation to do this. I assure you, this is simple stuff. And I've been I've been amazed at the transformation we've seen in two cohorts of people who've been through the mind-body medicine course, two, two groups of faculty. I'm stunned by how much change they undergo in just a matter of weeks. So, no, I think the culture's there. I think it needs to improve. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the major innovations, we are trying to break down with the Liam course, bringing faculty from those programs in the College of Medicine, like uh, College of Business, like Ryan Quinn, College of Education, like Brad Shuck, and introducing them to this next generation of leaders so they know there's not a wall between us and Belknap and that there are great resources. So I think it's a slow process, but we, we need to be ever diligent and fresh on this and continue to to try and move this forward and articulate the importance of this. This grand rounds is, is a great example of the kind of things that should be discussed because otherwise we're, we're operating head down the same old way and we're not going to make it work in the new value-based world that's coming to meet us. Okay. Do we have time for a question? 
Any question for the panelists? Yes, sir, in the back. Can you identify yourself? And uh, my name is Robert Evans. I'm the division of EMT. Uh, so process and culture are so important, and EMR is going to drive all that. So can you tell me how this group of innovators on this campus is specifically involved in the discussions going on this campus right now about EMRs and how they're going to spread amongst the university and field fields on it? I'll take a stab at that. Right. Um, we, we have had presentations now from both Epic and Cerner on the outpatient EMR platforms that they have available. Um, as I said, I am convinced that Epic's the right one for everyone, but there are financial, political, and logistical issues that make, make it difficult on the adult side to make that happen. We have invited faculty to come to those sessions. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm incredibly disappointed at how few people show up. In spite of everybody being aggravated about it, you know how many people came to my EPIC demonstration that we publicized a month before? Seven from the entire School of Medicine. Okay, that's an embarrassment for us and for the, the whole team. They brought four people down uh, from the EPIC shop. And so I'm committed to putting it in front of the right people so that they see what the real costs are because I think they'll be surprised that EPIC is not as expensive as the Cerner product. But it has to be a decision at the enterprise level for your health, your health system. So that's what's being done now. I, I'm, I have a clinical optimization steering committee made up of mid-level faculty that are committed to making this work better. And, and that's the effort that's going on right now. If you have another suggestion for us, please tell me. We'll, we'll put that in place. Well, I just mentioned I just came from the largest Epic installation in the country, and Epic has its problems too. And so the installation, both Epic and Cerner, depend very much on the very specifics of your campus and how you hold their feet to the fire to get various things done. But yes, out of the box, they're very generic, and so you have to actually get the innovation to them and try not to keep it so that you spend millions every year to innovate towards where you eventually want to be. So if the center of innovation could sort of hold both Epic and Cerner's feet to the fire for specific items that we want to see on this campus based on all the other information that's available from installations all over the country that the companies don't want to tell you when they install it, that could be a very useful device because I don't think that pressure has been brought to bear with either of these uh, big companies who can essentially tell us what they want us to do when they install it unless we really push them at the outset. I, I don't disagree at all. They come in with their product and you have, you have to start from scratch in some cases. Best I can tell, the Epic people tell me that is there is more in there than the Cerner and Allscripts where it's a series of acquisitions that brought them together and interfaces that have to go and get built. The Epic platform is one thing. And so, they're, but you're right, they all have trouble. I work with Epic at Norton Children's Hospital. I still spend two hours a day writing notes on one service over there, e even with the wonderful epic that's there. It's not perfect. All right. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Ian. Can I ask? Uh, I totally hear what you're saying. And part of what we're doing is, um, in fact, I'm visiting another children's hospital next week. We're looking at end users uh, who have the product and have gone through all the growing pains that you just described in that way and to know what variables we should be asking for in the future in that way. Uh, the other thing I would suggest to you is that we have a, a small team of very savvy junior faculty, and we pick them by the most uh, uh, the people who had the best smartphones in the in the, the in the department, uh, who are sort of our IT Their gamer tag. It, it's 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 exactly, and they are kind of our IT uh, workforce, and so we screen and vet stuff through them because they are about the most tech savvy people in the entire department in that way. And, and uh, it helps the fact that w one of their spouses is a programmer for both Epic and Cerner. So we actually have an in inside intel as to what is really possible and capable uh, for the future. So we should wrap it up. I know we're a couple minutes over, but we can stick around for, uh, for, for questions after. I want to thank our panel of leaders that came and talked to us about innovation. Thank you guys very much. Dr. Lettering, any comments? We're done? Okay, good. Thank you.